Mr. Chairman, I am Ron Diebert, Professor of Political Science and the founder and director of the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto's Monk School. Since 2001, the Citizen Lab has researched information security issues, and one of the principal areas of our research has been the mercenary spyware industry, in which private actors sell hacking services to governments. We are widely recognized as one of the world's leading authorities on this topic, I and my staff have testified or provided briefings numerous times to the U.S. White House, the Department of State, Congress, the European Parliament, and other governments on this topic. I'm very pleased to be speaking about it for the first time before a Canadian House of Commons committee. Today, I want to highlight several themes that arise from this research. First, the mercenary spyware industry is very poorly regulated and proliferating quickly. The industry lacks public accountability and transparency. It thrives in the shadows of the clandestine world and is spreading fast without proper controls. Second, we have documented extensive harms and abuses in just about every jurisdiction in which spyware is deployed. Governments routinely use spyware to hack civil society, political opposition, journalists, lawyers, activists, family members, and other innocent victims, both domestically and abroad, including victims living here in Canada. Third, the mercenary spyware industry is not only a threat to civil society and human rights, it is also a threat to national security. We've observed heads of state and senior government officials who've had their phones hacked with spyware. Not long ago, we notified UK authorities about a device we observed being hacked in 10 Downing Street, residence of the Prime Minister. In short, our 10 plus years of research shows the spyware industry is one of the most serious threats to civil society, human rights and democracy today. The recent revelation about the RCMP using spyware raises serious concerns. First, spyware is not like a traditional wiretap. It is more like a wiretap on steroids. Advanced spyware is to surveillance as nuclear technology is to weapons. It represents a quantum leap forward in sophistication and power. The latest versions provide silent and unfettered access to a target's entire pattern of life. Despite these nuclear level capabilities, it is remarkable that there has been zero public debate in Canada prior to the RCMP's recent revelation. Second, the threshold for use, oversight, transparency, and public accountability must be much higher than for a traditional wiretap. This is especially critical because the RCMP and other security agencies in Canada have a well-documented history of abuses and discriminatory practices. Third, we need transparency with respect to where Canadian agencies are procuring this technology. Yesterday, the Minister of Public Safety would not acknowledge to this committee from which vendor or vendors the Canadian government purchased spyware. There is absolutely no reason why that should not be disclosed and plenty of good reasons that it should. Our procurement should be transparent and include rules for vendors so we do not purchase from and help enrich firms that sell to governments abroad that threaten Canada's values and security. Fourth, there are serious public safety concerns around the very existence of this technology. Mercenary spyware is founded on the discovery of software flaws that the software vendors themselves are unaware of or have not patched. The very use of this technology fuels a market that exploits collective insecurity on all of our devices. Canada's overall process, such as it is, to weigh the equities around these trade-offs is poor and opaque. Fifth, the RCMP's quiet revelation sets a very bad example for the rest of the world. The Canadian government purports to protect human rights and stand for rule of law and democracy around the world. In adopting this technology without public debate and proper limits, we are essentially signaling to the world do, that we do not really care about these principles. I close my remarks with seven specific recommendations. First, Hold public hearings on the threats of the mercenary spyware industry, especially since Canadians have been victims. Second, if Canadian agencies are going to use spyware, public consultation should be held and the government should develop a legal framework that is compliant with the Charter and international human rights law. 
Third, Canada should develop strong export controls for the Canadian surveillance industry. Currently, there are none. Fourth, Canada should penalize spyware firms that are known to facilitate human rights abuses abroad, modeled after those in the United States. Fifth, Canada should issue clear and forceful statements at the highest levels, for example, from the Prime Minister, Minister of Public Safety, and Minister of Foreign Affairs, that we take this threat seriously. Six. You're significantly Canada over should, time. Please, quickly, please, on the last two. Six. Canada should impose a lifetime ban for those who have worked in our security agencies from ever working with mercenary spyware firms. And lastly, Canada should make public which firms they are contracting with and develop procurement guidelines for Canadian agencies so they never contract with firms that are connected to human rights abuses. Inviting the Canadian Civil Liberties Association to appear before you today. I'm grateful to the committee for commencing this study of the RCMP use of on-device investigative technology because it's an issue of national concern that is also a symptom of a larger problem of inadequate oversight and accountability when police acquire and use advanced surveillance technology. The revelations about ODIT are just the latest in a series of similar media-led reveals regarding invasive techniques from social media monitoring to cell site simulators to the illegal Clearview AI facial recognition. This isn't a one-off problem, it's a pattern pointing to a crisis of accountability. Operational secrecy is a legitimate need in specific investigations. Secrecy around policies that apply to categories of dangerous surveillance technologies is not legitimate in a democracy. We must not allow law enforcement bodies to conflate one with the other to avoid accountability. Why are these technologies dangerous from a civil society perspective? This committee is aware of the basic risks to privacy rights, so I'll focus on three other reasons. First, our government agencies are encouraging an industry known for prioritizing profits over human rights and feeding the worst impulses of authoritarian governments. I work with a network of global civil liberties organizations where many of my colleagues see Canada as a role model on issues of law enforcement and due process. This kind of revelation diminishes our international reputation, not just at the level of governments, but on the ground. Second, using these tools encourages law enforcement, as Professor Diebert noted, to exploit vulnerabilities in the technologies we all depend on, rather than help get them fixed. We've known for some time that the CSE has dueling accountabilities in relation to their active cyber mandate and their responsibility to protect our cyber infrastructure. Now we know the RCMP have a similar conflict. This is making us all a bit less safe daily in the name of public safety. And finally, there's a question of due process. Your witnesses yesterday noted that an agreement detailing the ways the technology has to be protected is a condition of its use. What impact does that agreement have on court disclosures? Are cases ever not taken forward because to do so would reveal details of the technology? In other words, how does operational secrecy compromise the pursuit of justice? Those are some of the problems. What are the potential solutions? First of all, I do believe we need a moratorium. This study is just the beginning of an important public conversation we need to have in Canada. It's true, if it's true, that this technology is a last resort option, it can't be that much of a risk to public safety to pause its use briefly, certainly not when weighed against the privacy and due process rights at stake, as well as the social and diplomatic impacts of the Canadian government condoning the sale and use of spyware. Then we need to get back to basics, and the basic question isn't how do we make sure the RCMP or any other body uses these tools lawfully? Rather, it must be, is the use of such tools necessary, proportionate, and in keeping with Canadian values? It probably won't surprise you that I think it is not. I think, like Europe and the United States, we should include the potential for a ban on state purchase of this kind of spyware technology in those conversations we need to have. But if it is democratically debated and determined that it is fit for a narrow purpose, the second question we then need to turn to is how to make the concept of lawful use more meaningful by updating our laws to appropriately govern the decisions to purchase and use these technologies and to provide transparency and accountability sufficient to engender public trust. For those laws to be good enough, we need stringent, effectively enforced import and export controls and limits. 
We need a system where decisions about using controversial, potentially rights-infringing technologies can no longer happen behind the scenes. For that, we need not just mandatory privacy impact assessments, but should consider the creation of a truly independent advisory body, working with appropriate transparency specifically to evaluate and set national standards for the procurement and use of surveillance technologies, as they have done in New York State. We would also need public reporting rec obligations on the use of audits. The annual report on the use of electron electronic surveillance repeatedly mentioned as an accountability measure is insufficient. The tools used for this surveillance matter. That's why we're having this conversation. Yet that report simply gives statistics for any audio or visual surveillance, which leads to a final point. Only one warrant application of the 331 in that report was refused between 2016 and 2020. That suggests that we need a public interest amicus present at those applications to provide a counterpoint to police positions. There are more problems and more solutions, but my five minutes up, so I look forward to your questions. To both uh, Professor uh, Divert and Ms. McPhail, uh, has your organizations uh, studied in depth uh, which uh, vendors are um, potentially in use here in Canada that uh, sell spyware? Which one should go first? Your Brendan? choice. Professor, why don't you lead off? You got your sure. mic on. So we, we have documented extensively uh, spyware vendors around the world, and unfortunately, uh, we lack transparency on this uh, the answer to this question here in Canada because there is no uh, public information available uh, to any of us as to which vendors uh, the government is procuring from, which, as I mentioned in my comments, is very problematic. As you heard yesterday, uh, when asked pointedly about this question, the Minister of Public Safety declined to answer, and I don't think that's a legitimate answer. Ms. McPhail? We have not done that research. Okay. Uh, Ms. McPhail, you, you mentioned in your opening comments the concern that maybe the RCMP hasn't proceeded in uh, the prosecution of certain criminal cases or national security threats because they would have to disclose that they used audit. Um, do you have any uh, proof of that, that they would rather not prosecute uh, to protect the technology? There have been, there is a case in the past uh, called Project Clemenza, where it was revealed that a number of prosecutions were dropped rather than reveal the fact that a, a key to um, access encrypted communications had been obtained by law enforcement. That's the only example I know of. But the mention of a specific agreement, which your witnesses yesterday described as constraining the use of the tools and what could be said about them in public, does give rise to concern about appropriate disclosures in court. Do you believe that the failure of the RCMP to fo uh, go forward with that prosecution was because they didn't have a proper warrant uh, that they uh, used to collect that information on those uh, individuals or that uh, they did so under other um, mechanisms such as national security? Anecdotally, I'm led to understand that it was done to protect the use of the tool, not because incorrect warrants weren't acquired. Okay. Um, you know, often when I've traveled abroad, I've been briefed by uh, Department of Foreign Affairs officials or Department of National Defense officials uh, about the potential of having my cell phone hacked or that the camera and the microphone could be turned on at any time. Um, do you believe that we need to take extra precautions here in Canada as parliamentarians, as uh, people that work on the Hill, that uh, our government issued uh, phones are potentially hacked uh, by not just foreign actors, but others uh, domestically as well. And I'll give that to both Ms. McPhail and Professor uh, Dielbert. I do think it's a concern, but I also think Professor Dielbert is best prepared to answer this question. Okay, Professor? Yes, I think it's a major concern. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, you have devices that are highly invasive and tend to be poorly secured overall, given the nature of the digital ecosystem that we live in, next to an industry, as I've described, that spends millions of dollars 
to identify software flaws without disclosing them to the vendors in order to provide this hacking as a service. We've also documented numerous cases of government officials and even heads of state be having their devices hacked with the most advanced spyware. As I mentioned in my open remarks, uh, we observed a hacked device in 10 Downing Street, uh, the residence of the Prime Minister, and reported that to UK authorities. So really, no one is immune from the most advanced types of spyware, and there are no international regulations, and it's proliferating widely to governments around the world. Professor, in, in the research that you've done, do you believe that, uh, although it would be unethical, but do you believe that um, employers, including the Government of Canada, uh, would be able to get clearance to uh, use uh, spyware uh, as a way to monitor employees uh, and people of interest that have government-issued or company-issued devices? Would there be a loophole where they could get around uh, having to apply for warrants because it would be property owned by the employer? Well, that's an interesting question. I know there are all sorts of rules and usually disclosures are made when anyone uses a device within an institution, public or otherwise. If it weren't disclosed, I would certainly say that it's highly unethical and possibly illegal. But I think uh, Ms. McPhail would be better positioned to answer that question on legal grounds. Uh, with a Mr. D. Bert, uh, I want to go back uh, to a little bit in your opening statement, and you were you've been talking about how governments use spyware to hack people's phones, and you mentioned that this has happened here in Canada. I'm wondering if you can get into a little bit more detail about the cases that you know of, mm -hmm. what governments are involved in hacking, and what cases have we seen here in Canada. Thank you for that question, certainly. So in 2018, uh, we observed that Saudi Ara Arabia was undertaking espionage and we could observe based on our, our network monitoring that there was a hacked device in Quebec and we al ultimately uh, discovered that uh, the person whose device was hacked was a Canadian per permanent resident named Omar Abdul Aziz, who was a very close friend and confidant of Jamal Khashoggi. And we published our report on October 1st, 2018. The very next day, uh, unfortunately, Jamal Khashoggi was apprehended and brutally uh, executed in the, um, in, in the uh, uh, Saudi uh, embassy, the consulate in Turkey. Um, we have also documented uh, extensively other uh, Canadian refugees, immigrants who have had their phones either targeted or hacked. Uh, by foreign governments abroad as part of a growing uh, number of cases that we call digital transnational repression. So the, the long and short of it here is that Canadians are definitely not, not immune to this worldwide risk that is growing in leaps and bounds, which is precisely why I think we need to be entering into this very serious conversation with a much more comprehensive approach than we have been to date. Okay, well, I agree. It's a good conversation to have. So what do you mean by a more comprehensive approach? How can we protect ourselves against these international bad actors? Well, first of all, as I said in my recommendations, I, I think we need to understand that we have an obligation uh, to do more than just speak words about this topic. In fact, I, I wish we even spoke words about it, but really I've seen nothing coming out of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Prime Minister equal to the level of statements coming out, just to give one example, the United States and the Biden administration at the highest levels, the White House, Department of State, Department of Justice, have all uh, made very powerful statements and have held inquiries and have started to uh, penalize firms, recognizing the very serious gravity worldwide of this problem that's both a human rights issue and a national security issue. So I could reiterate my recommendations, but I think we need to begin with the fact that we have no export controls uh, for Canadian firms that sell surveillance technologies abroad. That needs to change. Uh, we need to be more transparent about from whom we are procuring this technology. As you heard yesterday, the Minister of Public Safety wouldn't even acknowledge who they're buying this from. That There's no operational security reason why we shouldn't do that and many good reasons why we should. 
Why? Because our procurement is a lever on the industry. If we're going to spend millions of dollars buying this technology, and it's very expensive, by the way, we can impose conditions on the firms and say, you know what, we're not going to buy from firms that have been widely associated with gross human rights violations, both abroad and here in Canada, unless they comply with certain standards. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question for Mr. Deberg. If we look at the study, to ma maintain uh, the trust for, uh, of the population with the RCMP as us ye yesterday. We have to basically believe what the RCMP tells us because we don't have any means to delve any deeper. So maybe uh, to be able to uh, uh, teach the population, first of all, I'd like to ask, uh, can, do, can we really trust when basically that's all we are told we have, can do? My answer to that would be to invoke someone that you'll remember, and we're showing our age here, Ronald Reagan, uh, who in response to Mikhail Gorbachev said, uh, we need to trust but verify. And I think this applies to all of our security agencies. In a liberal democracy, it's essential that you have robust safeguards, oversight mechanisms, public accountability and transparency. What we are seeing here is clearly uh, failing that. And, uh, you know, if you compare it uh, to what's going on in other countries, um, it's not setting a very good example. It's in line with some of the flawed democracies around the world. Um, so I, I think we need to have a much more robust net cast over all of this if we're going to use this type of technology, which, by the way, is like a quantum leap in capabilities. This is much different than a wiretap we're talking about here. Uh, a device provides a window into every aspect of a person's life and those around them. Uh, so as I said in my remarks, this is nuclear level surveillance technology. We need appropriate safeguards to match that sophistication and power. Donc vous ne serez pas d'accord avec you time and um, I, I'm going to offer you the uh, the option to either continue with your round now or uh, we'll just we'll pause you'll have um, uh, you'll have uh, four minutes and ten seconds left and uh, we can go straight and, and get the opening remarks now from uh, um, from uh, mr. Uh, uh, Juno uh, I guess we'll get the remarks you. I guess Wait, it's up to you <laughs> no please go ahead with the remarks. All right, then uh, then I, I would like to, at this point to welcome our, our third witness I'm glad that we, or at least I hope we've got all of our technical problems sorted out. I still don't. Okay, now I see your image and welcome to committee and I will um, permit you now to make your opening statements up to five minutes. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. I'm sorry for the technical problems. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the invitation and the opportunity to speak to you on an important issue, one that gives a rise to many other issues. At the outset, I would like to summarize my thoughts based on my experience in the service of this nation and in the private sector, which now totals over 40 years. This is part of my research work and the work that I've done in national security. What is being presented for your reflection is the appropriateness, the legality, the legitimacy, and the accountability of using a technology or technologies that can intercept conversations or obtain information that may be protected by the Privacy Act. Immediately, I would like to emphasize the importance of privacy as defined by the Charter and Canadian law. This protection is one of the central pieces of a healthy democracy, and without it, there is no democratic strait possible. Having said that, I would like to put forward three punts that are central to my testimony, and I'll come back to them. First of all, when it comes to criminal or national security investigation, with the adage that the end justify the means cannot be applied. Secondly, partisan jousting has no place in such a debate, and it is the fruit of your collective work that will bring a better protection to our democracy and to our fellow citizens. And finally, having said that, this committee has a great moral and ethical responsibility to provide the legal framework and tools necessary so that men and women who are charged with protecting us can do so adequately and with respect for the foundations of our justice system. 
one major trap for anybody uh, for anybody responsible for collective safety is to believe that the end justified the mean. It is the most dangerous deception law enforcement officers are facing in the maze of bureaucracy and court system. Eager to accomplish their work of protecting us and waiting to stop criminal and terrorists ready to arm us, some officers might be tempted to go around the law. Our own Canadian history teach us uh, uh, the mistakes of the 60s and the 70s when the RCMP were put in charge of stopping communist agents or separatist zealots. In the name of protecting us, the RCMP, officer, uh, RCMP officers broke the law, believing that they were doing the right things. They were misled and wrong. I listened and paid attention to the testimony given to you in the last days. I did not see or hear history repeating itself. I saw officer who under pressure of not jeopardizing operational or tactical capabilities, answering, I believe, to the best of their ability, as much as possible, your question. Thanks to your important work, it is evident that we can en enhance the approval process by improving consultation with the Privacy Commissioner, the reporting and evaluation mechanism, and the law itself. In addition, I was pleased to hear that the court system is, has kept in place the check and balances. That is good news and gives us hope that we are on a good track to improve our democracy system and accountability, accountability process. Mon deuxième point, m'inquiète. My second point is more worrisome because I have observed behaviors of some members of the committee that are of concern. Asking questions, even difficult questions, is the job and the responsibility of committee members. One guiding, but one guiding principle must prevail. You must protect and look after the interests of this nation's and its citizens and not the partisan interests of your political agenda. Agenda. If you have questions that involve technical, tactical, or strategic cap capabilities, you must do in camera. Public. Some of the bad guys, being criminal or foreign agents, are listening and taking notes. Asking questions, pushing to get, for example, the country of origin of a technology that must remain secret, is to serve on a silver platter to the bad guys the means to counter the tactical capabilities. To continue making fake allegation of mass surveillance when there is no evidence that it 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 is mis uh, uh, no evidence uh, that it is misleading and dividing our society. Thirty nine cases, forty one devices spread over f more than five years is not mass surveillance. Comme je l'indiquais. As I said in my opening remarks, I have been observing and analyzing the threats to our society and our citizens for over 42 years. I have been one of those who have put their heart and soul into protecting our country and its people. I have experienced the frustrations and successes of our investigations and of efforts to prevent criminal spies and terrorists from harming us individually and collectively. I cannot describe to you with enough accuracy and thoroughness the waves of emotion that come over investigators when a bad guy wins because he has taken advantage of a flaw in our legal system. Ms. Danced. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I will re resume. Mr. Mr. Dufresne himself yesterday have stressed the uh, uh, importance of stressing the public interest or working on the public interest. Uh, in trust, to, the trust today is more crucial than ever for both our democratic system and our uh, that you pr represent and the law enforcement and security agency that work hard for us. Je vous remercie de votre écoute. I would like to thank you for listening, and I hope you won't. Uh, uh, that you will hold my comments and warnings. It won't hold them against me. Correct thank these trends and to much the greater attention to the population is asking. Gentlemen okay, and thank ladies, you. I'm, I'm really going to have to let, uh, let uh, Monsieur Vermeer resume his, uh, his questions. You have uh, four minutes and ten seconds. Go ahead. Uh, Too bad. It was Monsieur good text. <laughs> I believe it. But, <laughs> uh, time is uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to ask you with respect to trust, and I've come to my main point. What the, the, the RCMP, uh, should we, uh, what they've said, or should that give us trust, or is it a question of, uh, should it put them in doubt? Go ahead, it's, this question is for you. 
Well, I think that the actions of the RCMP are important to be able to uh, conserve uh, public trust. The mechanism of accountability, consultation, judicial mechanisms that are in place are necessary to be able to ensure that we can improve uh, this trust and conserve it. So I think that we've learned that there have been historic situations that historically we've learned from lessons from that and what we were told yesterday and also the uh, d different uh, types of reflections suggested by uh, Mr. Dufresne and other interveners are excellent to be able to help the committee make good recommendations. Thank you very much, Mr. De Burke. For the, the benefit of the population, can you describe what, exactly what spyware does? What can it do? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question, Mr. Chairman. So um, we have been studying many different types of spyware and the most advanced allows uh, persistent access uh, to a target's device, which in turn allows them to do anything on that device and more that a user can do without the user knowing. Uh, some of the latest versions of the spyware employ what's known as zero click versions, meaning there's no need to trick a target onto, into clicking on a link of a fake message. Uh, a user, a government client of spyware can simply issue a command and take over any device in the world that's uh, that's vulnerable to this type of exploit. Once inside a device, you can intercept and listen to any phone call. You can read emails and text messages, even those that are encrypted. You could silently turn on the camera and microphone. You can review all of the contacts. You can alter files on the device. You can access a person's cloud account. You can track their location. Uh, so it is extraordinary, powerful surveillance technology. Keep in mind, uh, we live in a different time than even 20 years ago when a wiretap was something you'd put on a landline or you'd place a bug in a suspect's car or maybe a GPS tracker in their car. Um, this gives you all of that and more uh, because these devices are designed by their manufacturers to be as invasive invasive as possible. They're designed as well as the apps contained in, in them to track every aspect of our lives. So this is a, a gold mine of information that is available uh, to clients of spyware. Merci, Mr. Dibert, et je vais poursuivre. Thank you, Mr. Dibert. I'd like to continue with you. Yesterday we were told that there were warrants and that, and that a judge had to validate or, author, uh, author, or authorize uh, that this was good of, or oversight. I don't know if you share my point of view. A situation may be legal, but it may not be ethical. And we've said that, that the legislation is tw some years, 20 years old, and so there is a risk there. So even if we remain with legality, we can be unethical in our use. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think that the disclosure that there were warrants is certainly reassuring. I'm glad it's not the opposite case. However, I think that we need to put judicial oversight in the context of a number of different factors related to this uh, environment, this topic that we're describing. Uh, first of all, I think there is a problem with transparency and public accountability within our law enforcement agencies. In fact, there's a pattern, as my colleague Ms. McPhail said, of not disclosing ahead of time certain investigative techniques that require a public consultation. Uh, again and again, these are coming out through media revelations or in a kind of backhanded way. That's not the way to approach this. Uh, Debert, you talked about it being rogue mercenary companies. Can you perhaps expand on from your research, what this sector looks like, who's acting in it, um, you know, where where these where the subject matter expertise is coming from, and why we mm -hmm. should be concerned about that. So very little is known about this industry. It operates in the shadows by definition. It's sil similar to the trade in weapons technology or private intelligence. Uh, so these firms, generally speaking, don't like uh, to publicly disclose what they're doing or who their clients are. That makes uh, public accountability and transparency very difficult. We at the Citizen Lab, along with several other organizations, have spent well over 10, close to 15 years investigating this industry using a variety of technical methods and forensic methods. What we found is that there is almost no international regulation around this industry. They're selling to just any government client. 
Um, most of the governments, unfortunately, in the world are authoritarian or a liberal. And naturally, they're using this technology not in the ways that we're hoping for it to be used here. They're using it to go after political opposition, civil society, journalists, activists, and others. And they're making millions of dollars doing so, and they obfuscate their corporate infrastructure from investigators like us. Uh, this is a very serious global human rights and national security issue. All you need to do is look at the reactions at the most senior levels of the United States government, the Biden White House, the Department of Justice, the Department of State, uh, U.S. Commerce Department, have all come out and said effectively exactly what I'm saying to you right now. So we are really asleep at the wheel on the threats raised by the global mercenary spyware industry, and we need to urgently correct that. So uh, I know that there's been local reporting, and we've heard it here today in testimony from the government side, referencing a, a, a former prime minister, Stephen Harper, being involved. I think there's reports of a former ambassador to Israel uh, also being involved, or at least reporting on being involved. Can you speak to the relationship between those within governments who've had perhaps some of the highest level of security clearance, then acting, and I think quite rightly, you framed it as a mercenary sector. Can you talk about the dangers of, uh, you know, people who have access to national uh, top clearances, then retiring into this sector, uh, both from elected and civil agencies, but also from some of our highest law enforcement agencies as well? Thank you for that question. This is a very serious concern because there is a well-documented revolving door. People who work for intelligence services then go off and make money, some of them very honorably, unfortunately, some of them not. I think it's shameful that a former prime minister would be involved in selling surveillance technologies, brokering Canadian firm sales to golf clients that have a well-documented history of human rights uh, abuses, which is why I said in my recommendations that we need to impose a lifetime ban for those who've worked uh, for intelligence and law enf enforcement from ever working for mercenary spyware firms. We also need to have clear rules in this country on export controls over surveillance technologies. Citizen Lab has documented uh, the export of censorship and surveillance technologies made by Canadian-based firms that have helped facilitate, uh, frankly, violations of human rights abroad that would be unacceptable in this country. And I'm shocked to say that there really is zero uh, licensing or export controls in this country for the export or sale of spyware and surveillance technology of the type that we're talking about to hear. Be clear, uh, so we can have you on the record, sir. Just to be clear, w is that a recommendation that you're providing this committee that we that we would recommend as a committee that these things be implemented, or is that just a comment? No, 100%. It was in my testimony as a specific recommendation. We desperately need guidance to Canadian businesses clear ground rules as to to whom they can sell their technology so that we don't end up having Canadian firms supplying surveillance technology to regimes abroad like they have in the United Arab Emirates, Russia, Turkey, elsewhere around the world to help facilitate uh, practices that would be clearly uh, a violation of the charter in this country. And there's still the concern that our government could do indirectly what it's not allowed to do directly by then taking advantage, perhaps, of information that might be unlawfully obtained by foreign actors. They could be friendly foreign actors. You know, you look at the use of Pegasus in places like Mexico, but Pegasus is just a brand. I mean, it's the technology that's out there that's pervasive. So could you comment perhaps on the possibility of uh, having in the hands of government information that might be politically sensitive? We've seen this technology used against the media and against uh, partisan opposition. Um, so is that something you'd, you'd care to expand on and comment on in the final close here? Well, Mr. Chairman, I would say that many of the uh, manufacturers of spyware have close relationships for geostrategic reasons to the governments within which they're located. And I don't have any confidence that information that is collected by those spyware governments or spyware companies on behalf of government clients ends up being passed on to specific individuals connected to their home government jurisdictions, which is why it's also a security risk that we need to have better due diligence around procurement. Uh, with due respect to one of my um, fellow panelists here, 
I don't see any operational security reason why we cannot disclose from whom we're purchasing this technology. It, it, disclosing that, uh, frankly, has no bearing or tips off no one. It's good practice. It's it's mature uh, and a mature approach to uh, a 21st century. Have. Do you find the RCMP's decision to keep this information from Canadians acceptable? No, I don't find it acceptable at all, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I actually think that I heard something slightly differently from the testimony. It sounded to me like one of the RCMP officers testified that they were using this type of technology much further back than 2017, which really is no surprise. As Ms. McPhail testified a few moments ago, there is a pattern. Uh, where law enforcement agencies are reluctant for whatever reason to disclose what type of surveillance techniques they're using or specific technologies, hide them from the public, and then somehow this information can get, gets out through media or whatever, a tip requests, and they have to scramble uh, to produce documents to justify ex post facto how they're using it. Do you think one of the recommendations I feel we're going to have from this study is that all the government agencies, no matter who they are, should have to complete or be mandated to complete or lawfully complete a privacy impact assessment. Do you agree with that recommendation? 100%. It's the least that could be done, in my view. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McPhail, uh, your organization has called ODIT the nuclear option for surveillance for the RCMP. Why do you refer it as a nuclear option? Thank you for that question. Um, I think Professor Debert has referred to this, but I'll elaborate. Uh, we had yesterday an RCMP witness say, to paraphrase, we don't actually think about doing a privacy impact assessment just because we're using a new technology. We consider whether the technology permits a new kind of invasion, which sounds kind of logical until you break it down because that formulation of the nature of the search ignores the reality of an ODIT, which allows all the invasions all at once on a device that we, not they, own. So did they do wiretaps before? Of course. Did those wiretaps allow access to the contents of every form of communication, written and oral, professional and private, retrospectively and prospectively, including data that's not actually on the device itself, but in the cloud? Of course not. Is it the same level of invasion? No. Did police install covert cameras in homes and places of business with warrants in the past? Of course. Did a single camera have the ability to move with an investigative subject from work to home, from bedroom to bathroom, 24 hours a day? Of course not. Is it the same level of invasion? No. And an audit can do more. It can record live audio, it can track location, it collects device identifiers, it tracks internet searches, it follows application use. So, I mean, should a PIA have been required? Of course. Um, but even that, as Professor Debert said, is not enough when we're talking about the enormity of the invasion. Do you, do you believe that the same recommendation, that no matter who they are, any government agency using new technology should, should be required to do a public or a privacy uh, impact assessment? Any government agency wishing to use um, potentially rights infringing surveillance technology that carries high risk to the public should absolutely have to do a mandatory privacy impact assessment, which should be made in an appropriate form public. Thank you. Mr. Juno uh, Katsuya, in your work uh, with government in the past or in, in your research, are any other agencies besides the RCMP using any any similar technology that it, that we're investigating with the RCMP? Um, you would have to be a little bit more specific, but some of the technology, of course, CSE, is, is CSE, anything like that. That do we? I guess the question is: Do you have any knowledge that any other government agencies besides the RCMP would be using anything like this Pegasus-like technology? Uh, other agencies are using it, probably. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I. 
I'm out of time. You've got, well, you got to... You know, and, and uh, I think we're both on the World Movement for Democracy Steering Committee. Uh, I've long been uh, an admirer of much of the work that Citizen Lab has been doing globally, uh, both on disinformation, on cyber harassment of uh, human rights activists. Um, so I, 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 I think you've raised some very concerning points uh, with regard to how authoritarian regimes are using uh, these kinds of tools. And um, I know that, you know, some of the things in terms of what this committee is looking at specifically, uh, some of the things that you mentioned, uh, particularly when you're talking about the digital transnational repression and other things um, might more suitably uh, be discussed in the Foreign Affairs Committee or even the Subcommittee on International Human Rights on which I sit. Um, and I think there'd be some significant interest in looking at that, including things like export controls. Um, but my question to you is more specific specifically about, um, you know, I think you'll agree that when the RCMP are using these, these tools and they're doing it in a very narrow scope, uh, they're, they're doing it, I think you mentioned things like proportionate, necessary, um, and they're using it with judicial oversight uh, and, and warrants. Um, that's a very different thing than some, somebody like China or Iran and how those regimes are using this kind of technology. Um, so s setting aside issues like the vendors and the export controls, uh, you mentioned something that I think was interesting. You talked about having thresholds. If you could elaborate a little bit about what those kinds of thresholds to prevent abuse of these kinds of powers, um, what would those thresholds look like? Thank you for that question. Um, I think overall, it's assuring, uh, reassuring that we heard testimony from the RCMP uh, yesterday and from the minister that um, the instances of the use of this type of technology were undertaken with judicial authorization. However, as I said before, I think uh, just because we hear from the RCMP uh, that there was judicial authorization shouldn't be seen as like some kind of magic wand uh, that makes everything else magically disappear, nothing to see here, go about your business. Um, first of all, we know that there is a well-documented history of abuse uh, within law enforcement uh, in this country. There's a documented history of discriminatory practices. Um, I also have concerns about uh, the nature of the technology itself and whether with all due respect to, to judges who I have confidence in, whether they truly understand uh, the scope and scale and sophistication and power of the type of invasive technology that we're talking about, the Miss McPhail just really accurately uh, described. Um, I also think there are equities issues that need to be discussed here because, um, you know, I routinely and my team routinely uh, forensically analyzes victims of spyware and in several instances we've actually recovered copies of the spyware and made responsible disclosures to the vendors unlike what the government agencies do um, these disclosures have re resulted in security patches affecting more than billions several billions of people uh, worldwide if the government is going to withhold that information from the vendors and put all of our safety at risk there needs to be a proper process around that. That process typically is called the vulnerabilities equities process. Right now, as I said in my testimony, our process around uh, that in this country is weak. Uh, it's opaque. Frankly, it's nowhere near the level of where it should be for a mature liberal democracy. Um, so th those are some of the concerns that I have that go well beyond whether uh, the RCMP simply told us uh, that these uh, instances were authorized by a judge. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, my next question is for uh, Mr. Juno Katsuya. Um, I noted in your in your opening remarks that you didn't finish your uh, your last few the part of your opening statement. I want to give you some time to do that now. Hey, thank you very very much. Oh. What I wanted to bring to our attention is that unfortunately. Um, our society and particularly our democracy is under uh, is under siege. Uh, we're facing enormous threat, like probably since the initial concept of democracy has started to 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 operate to uh, appear in the 1600 and 1700. We've never been under uh, a threat like we are currently. Uh, the uh, far right, alternative right, is taking place. Uh, 
populist uh, discourses, uh, people using demagogy to uh, try to convince people and to bring in security. So in that perspective, I totally support uh, uh, the uh, idea of bringing more control, more accountability, more transparency. What I, uh, what I seek is a balance, a balance to not sort of uh, uh, prevent the uh, capability to also catch the bad guys. Because unfortunately, uh, all the nice discourses, theory and, 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 and philosophical debates, they don't, we're, they don't we're, care about this. Okay, thank you. We, we went quite a bit over. Are you in favor of having a third party that would examine the actions of the RCMP with respect to surveillance? Yes, I'm in favor of as many legitimate parties uh, as possible that are appropriate to make sure that we have proper accountability relative to the great leap forward in technological capabilities that law enforcement and security agencies have at their disposal today. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Mr. Junot, uh, you said at the end of your intervention that there are other agencies uh, that are probably using this technology. Do you believe that uh, the parliamentarians or elected officials have been uh, surveilled? We have had to uh, surveil parliamentarians because uh, there are parliamentarians of all level, whether it's municipal, uh, provincial, or uh, that uh, are federal, that are being paid by foreign governments and that are not necessarily acting in interests of Canada. So we do have people that are uh, working, whether it's uh, consciously or unconsciously, that, that they're uh, threatening uh, national security. Does a Pegasus type of secure surveillance used or was it beforehand? It was beforehand it's, uh, and it's uh, still happening. Uh, foreign agencies try to re to recruit uh, elected officials and it's, uh, it's fairly easy because uh, elected officials don't necessarily listen to the security uh, guidelines uh, to protect themselves or sometimes they may not they may be ignorant of it or maybe serve their own self-interest well thank you very much mr debert earlier you said uh, that the privacy impact of, uh, assessment was uh, uh, the minimum so what would be ideal we need to have uh, some kind of embedded presence of the office of the privacy commissioner i, I was frankly uh, very disappointed to hear that uh, the office of the privacy commissioner was not informed uh, about uh, these investigative techniques prior to the recent revelations so we need to have a, a much stronger presence and i would argue even more capabilities and resources for privacy commissioners to be to act as a watchdog over our security agencies that's not to minimize the the very important mission that law enforcement and other security agencies have in this country we want them to be well equipped but we need to have uh, organizations that watch the watchers in part that's the mission of the citizen lab too we act as a public Thanks, watchdog uh, that you uh, recommended that there be a civilian counterpoint to police uh, applications for warrants within the judicial process. Could you expand on that? Because that was something that I picked up as being a bit problematic in terms of uh, how there's accountability throughout the warrants process. Absolutely. And this echoes a recommendation that I made during the recent study around facial recognition technologies, which is that to counter this persistent pattern of police acquiring and using sophisticated and potentially controversial surveillance technologies without public disclosure, um, that we follow the lead of places like New York State, like New Zealand, in putting together an independent advisory panel that would include relevant stakeholders from the legal community, from government, from police and national security, from civil society, and of course our, our regulatory bodies who are relevant, like the Privacy Commissioner, uh, to act as sort of a national standard setting body, an advisory body, to take a proactive look at the kinds of technologies that our police forces want to use to modernize their investigative techniques and look at them across a range of considerations that includes ethical considerations, legal considerations, considerations um, around Canadian norms and values, 
and then make sort of standard setting, gold standard recommendations that police organizations, not just nationally, but provincially and territorially, because of course policing is, a, is also a provincial and territorial matter, um, so that we would have consistency and the public could be assured that rights were being respected while police had the tools they need to do their job. Um, I think that it's well known that Canada's privacy regime has fallen behind. I think that there have been many statements before this committee over the last almost decade documenting the ways in which our privacy laws, both public and private sector, fall short and fail and have gaps Th that thank fail. You. I found it very interesting that you said other agencies are also using similar software as what Pegasus is. Uh, what other agencies are using these kind of software and, and, and what are they doing with that? Well, the agencies are the na national security agencies. It's an inv investigative tool. They need to have it to uh, be capable to pursue some targets, uh, very dangerous, very serious people. And that is one of the tools that is accessible to them, yes. And what kind of software are they using? Is it the same software? Is it different for each uh, agency? I do not have all the details of what kind of software or the name of the software uh, at this point, and, and, and uh, I wouldn't be able to. How does um, a, a concept that uh, police, like the RCMP or police institutions, are monitoring and surveilling Canadians, what kind of impact does that have? I mean, to date, and we've heard from the RCMP, we've heard from the Privacy Commissioner with respect to exactly how many uh, investigations have been conducted that have used audit surveillance. Um, how, how does that impact public perception of the RCMP, of, of our governing institutions as, uh, you know, in general, as we've seen kind of the climate of disinformation and, and conspiracy theories being peddled um, in, in, in recent events? Uh, Professor Dybert, if you, if you have any comments on that. Well, if I understand your question correctly, if you're implying that there is disinformation about some of the concerns that are being raised uh, with respect to um, uh, the risks and threats of this particular industry uh, that's being, um, uh, uh, that, that, that our agencies are actually contributing to financially, uh, I think you're very wrong. Um, we have done well over a decade of evidence-based research that has been cited widely uh, using technical means. And we verified hundreds of individuals worldwide that are neither criminals or terrorists who've had their phones hacked using this type of spyware by governments, both authoritarian and democratic. In one of the most recent cases in Spain, we uncovered a massive surveillance espionage operation. Sorry to, to, to interrupt that. We're talking yeah. specifically about Canada, right? The, the scope of the motion and the study that we have here is specifically about the RCMP. So we're talking mm -hmm. specifically about Canada. If you could limit your answers to that, please. Sure. Like I said before, it's reassuring some of the remarks that we heard in the testimony from the RCMP um, in, in terms of numbers and judicial authorization. I also heard, however, uh, those numbers change in the course of a day. Uh, I heard that the privacy commissioner was not apprised of what's going on. I also heard that the RCMP it itself, in, in direct response to a question, say, yes, we undertake surveillance of Canadians, which would be silly not to say because that's part of their job. Uh, the issue is uh, precisely the lack of transparency and public accountability uh, because the way that we're entering into this conversation is kind of backwards, frankly. This was disclosed it seems to me almost by accident. And we shouldn't be having a conversation like this about this important topic in such a manner. That's not disinformation. Uh, what we're dealing with here is a, a very important question. We need to be mature about it and talk about it forthrightly rather than cast aspersions on people who are bringing up these important issues. Um, sir, uh, it's just again, I, I'm kind of dumbfounded uh, with what you just uh, testified in that um, Former politicians and politicians uh, who are considered potential national security threats are being um, monitored. Uh, in your experience as a former CSIS and RCMP officer, uh, in those situations, would jurisprudence be followed to ensure that their charter rights are protected by the issuing of warrants to wiretap or use spyware uh, on those individuals? 
to my knowledge, when a warrant was necessitated, yes, we were we used uh, the warrant, and the judiciary pro process was uh, followed. Very often, also, the uh, politician or elected official, I like to say, uh, were are not necessarily the, the initial target, but they were actually came to the attention when we were watching foreign intelligence officers or foreign criminals or uh, Canadian criminals uh, being in contact with them. And they be, it, it became a concern to uh, either CSIS or the RCMP when these people uh, demonstrated certain activities or certain actions uh, that were uh, questionable in light of their uh, resp responsible office. So, um, in these situations, like, uh, should I, as, a, as an elected official who has been very outspoken in my support of Ukraine, uh, Taiwan, and, and uh, other uh, democracies that are under threat, uh, be concerned that uh, I may be spied on by, my, uh, by Canadian uh, federal agencies because of my advocacy for those, or, uh, those countries? No, but you're likely to be concerned about foreign entities spying on you or wanted to I use you. I always am. And, but that's I, where, <laughs> and that's why I, CSUs I just and that. the RCMP <laughs> exist, uh, to try to protect you because of these uh, positions that you've, you've taken. This is the sort of what we enjoy in our society, this capability of having outspoken elected officials that speak on behalf of our community just like you do. Uh, but unfortunately, at the same time, you might become a target, and that's where we step in. So, um, when we're looking at the, the overall use of, of um, technology, and, and, and I would say that it's probably changed quite dramatically since you were uh, working for CSIS, um, how do we ensure that it is being used for the uh, you know, correct applications? Uh, you said in your opening statement that you don't want this committee to get into the details and undermine operational capability. But at the same time, as you've said, we need to have transparency, we need to have accountability, we need to know who is using this technology and how it's being applied. Um, where is the counterpoint in this where it tips that uh, we're undermining the ability of our law enforcement agencies and national security agencies to protect Canadians? I think, I think some of the uh, evidence that were presented, some of the testimonies that were presented in uh, Professor DeVert and others uh, uh, are on the right, right track to be capable to present certain um, uh, entities that will be capable to uh, do the uh, check and balances, the verification, and ask for the um, uh, accountability that is necessary. Uh, I think yesterday what I heard, maybe some people have heard differently, but I did hear the RCMP being open to this accountability. Maybe it didn't come soon enough or the, the transparency didn't come soon enough to, in the opinion of certain, but this is what this democracy in progress is about. This is constantly sort of something that needs to be verified. And I'm absolutely, absolutely, having been an officer in the front line, uh, I, I'm abso absolutely in favor of this capability, capability of accountability. As an officer in the front line, can CSIS as an intelligence agency uh, collect evidence uh, that's not bound by the Canada Evidence Acts or the Criminal Code? Uh, so can CSIS deploy you know, this type of spyware without a warrant? No. No, CSIS will usually have to go through a warrant process in order to be capable to collect that kind of sensitive and you use this kind of technology. Only if it's a Canadian. If it's a non-Canadian, they wouldn't re require to have a warrant? Uh, no. If somebody would present a threat to uh, national security, they can go against a foreigner. For example, uh, there is uh, 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 diplomats, do or not yes, diplomats, they are f foreign spies. We go after them. Okay, yeah, thank you. Be warranted. Um, but we've, it was also mentioned, and I do support the idea of including in both our public and private sector privacy laws, um, the existence of privacy as a fundamental human right, because that changes the nature of the balancing act that it's necessary to do when we're deciding whether businesses or governments are allowed to engage in invasive privacy practices. It puts the right um, at the center in a place where it should be in those balancing equations. Um, it's also worth looking at section six, or part six rather, 
of the criminal code, which to the best of my knowledge had its last very significant amendments more than or slightly more than 20 years ago. Um, it could be that experienced defense counsel in particular would be of great use to this committee in recommending um, alterations to that based on their experience with these kinds of contemporary technologies as their use emerges in criminal cases. Um, and lastly, as one more concrete thing, the United States has created an entity list of banned spyware vendors. Canada should absolutely consider doing the same thing. In your view, when law enforcement uses this type of spyware, do you think that contradicts or, or flouts uh, the Canadian Charter of Earth and Freedoms? Thank you. Um, from what we've been told, in the way that these tools have been used, the RCMP has attempted to stay within the confines of the Charter by ensuring that they get judicial authorization, by using these for a small number of investigations, um, and ensuring that it's only for crimes that are ostensibly particularly serious. Merci. The issue... Uh, Thank you. I have very limited time, so I have to make this quick. Mr. Uh, Debert, you mentioned that Canada is chairing the Freedom Online Coalition this year. Do you think that Canada has uh, the responsibility of setting the example in this sense? Yes, I do. What would be your first suggestions to this end? Like I said, I think that we need to have uh, from this, from senior officials, from the Prime Minister, from the Minister of Public Safety, from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, clear, forceful statements that this uh, industry that we're touching on in this committee is a threat to human rights and democracy and to our own national security, uh, that we are going to take measures aligned with our allies in the United States and Europe and elsewhere to start holding the worst actors in this industry more accountable and be more transparent and publicly accountable ourselves if we're going to use it domestically. Donc, on commence par le tone. So we're uh, starting by setting the tone at the top. Which we have not done, unfortunately, mm. in contrast to the United States. Absolutely. Merci beaucoup, Dalit. Yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Junokatsu. I have very limited time, but I was disturbed by the revelations that um, elected officials could be recruited by foreigners. Do you have a document that you can provide to the committee which can dig deeper a bit into th this, uh, this sort of uh, issue? I do not have official documents, um, but there might be, you know, I might come up with analysis based on my experience over the years, but to be able to obtain more detailed information, you would need to go to the entities in question. Uh, for instance, uh, CSIS, uh, the uh, former head of CSIS, for instance, uh, already mentioned in an interview that there have been elected officials at different levels that have been compromised. So I think the agencies themselves would have more information on that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Green for two and a half minutes. Thank you very much. Ms. McPhail, you would mentioned Section 6 and the fact that it had been 20 years since it's been um, revisited, and I think both you and uh, Professor Debert have talked at length about the ways and the order and magnitude in which technology has far surpassed legislative uh, guardrails or considerations. Uh, Section 6 was, was cited at length and, and very frequently by uh, both the minister responsible and the witnesses from the RCMP. Can you comment from your uh, perspective and opinion ways in which you think under the current legislation, the current laws of Section 6, there remains a big gap in terms of where we are now with uh, these types of technological powers? Part six of the criminal code, and I remind the committee I'm not a lawyer, although I work for a legal advocacy organization, um, is generally written to be technologically neutral and to allow for the right kinds of inquiries to be made with the right safeguards. Um, but because the technology has changed so fundamentally, um, my point was simply that those who are expert in the use of this part um, should be ideally allowed to comment on the ways in which it should be enhanced. Um, I'm not the best person to comment on but it. I, I simply I wish to flag that was a really important consideration. Yeah, and, and is it a consideration that you would put as a recommendation from this committee that we recommend the government review part six to ensure that it's in keeping with 
the advances in technology? Yes, that is my recommendation. And Pro Professor Debert, is that one that you share as well? That's correct. And I'll, I'll put the question to our, our last witness, and I, I apologize if your name has escaped me. Is that something that you would agree that uh, part six perhaps uh, hasn't necessarily kept pace with technology and could for the good and welfare of democracy and, and everything that you've espoused in your testimony uh, provide that, that updated um, information and legal analysis? It's a must. Oh. RCMP. Can you explain that in more detail to this committee, why that might be? Well, contrary to Professor DeBert, I do believe, because uh, we've done that ourselves, when we are capable to identify the technology that a foreign uh, government or our target is using, we are capable to either use countermeasure or to exploit that technology. So the knowledge, it, it becomes intelligence. It becomes important now to know what uh, the opponent is using in order to, like I said, to counter or to exploit it. Uh, that's why revealing it openly and this kind of technology, there's not a, it's not a myriad of, of, of company. There's a great number, there's a good number, but there's not a myriad of numbers. So by isolating the country where it's coming from and stuff like that, by deduction, you're capable to be identified what. So to turn into what uh, 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 Mr. Snowden has revealed with the NSA capability, it's like talking apple and, and oranges. The NSA has budgets and capability and intentions that are way different than what the RCMP and CSUS or the NDA is capable to deploy here in Canada.